A man stands atop the powerful beast he just cut in half. The soldier in front of him was shocked at his skill, seeing him defeat the beast, Algis, with one slash. They demand to know who he is, but the man says he's no one, identifying himself as a slave who simply grew up in a poor country. A woman looks over them in silence. In the kingdom of Karats, an elf named Feral makes her way to a room. She knocks, saying she's brought medicine, but the door suddenly explodes, making her call out to Ars, who is in the room. The smoke thins out and Ars Ditlin, the eldest prince of Karats, assures Feral that he's fine. He dusts himself off and says that he expected his experiment to fail, given the method he used. She's just relieved that he's safe and asks if he's still researching the same spell. To appease her worries, the prince says he'll just attempt one last time in preparation for the crown system tomorrow. The crown system is a ceremony where aristocrats and members of the royal family exhibit their power, improving their skills by taking on the role of adventurers. Through the event, capable kingdoms are able to instill fear in possible invaders and, at the same time, bring hope to their citizens, thereby keeping territorial order between different nations. A small number of people are gathered to take on powerful enemies, which is also why adventurers are highly respected in kingdoms. Knowing all this, Feral argues, not understanding why he would challenge the gluttonous dragon alone. It's one of the four great dragons, capable of destroying an entire country's military power. She adds that even if all of Kart's knights came together to fight it, the outcome would still be uncertain. He resolutely says that as the eldest prince, he'd be fulfilling his duty by defeating the foe alone, as no one would then dare to invade the kingdom in the future. He tells her not to worry and just watch him, confidently promising to defeat the dragon and become the strongest wizard. The next day, the ceremony ensues, and the gluttonous dragon wreaks havoc throughout Karts. Feral, also the leader of the kingdom's magic division, and the chief knight watch from afar, unable to find an opening to join the battle. He asks the elf if the prince can win, but she just relays the words telling her to watch him. She reaffirms her faith in him, believing him to be the greatest wizard in the world. On the battlefield, Ars barely dodges a powerful blast of fire. He's unsurprised by its power, expecting as much from the one nicknamed the Catastrophe and wonders if it can keep its energy up until dawn. The dragon prepares another breath of fire, but it's nothing to Ars, who counters with his own spell. The two fire blasts negate each other, forming a huge crater on the ground and sending him back. The beast flies to him, ready to strike, and he tries to fight back. Suddenly, the magician falls to his knees, his body collapsing from overexertion. The ground shatters from the attack, and the force knocks him away. He understands that the battle is too much for his body, but refuses to fall and give his goals up. Knowing that he'd lose a prolonged fight, he concludes that a final spell focused on one point would be his only way to victory. Despite being unsure of his ability to survive, he begins to chant, summoning a huge aura of pure magic energy, the ultimate magic spell. The chief sees this, excitedly saying that it's something only their prince can cast. Ars condenses all the energy into a smaller orb, bidding farewell to the dragon and telling it to fear his power. He unleashes an enormous burst of all attribute magic, consuming the enemy's entire body. By the end of it, a path had opened up where the blast hit, leaving only the gluttonous dragon's head. It drops to the ground, and the magician smiles, satisfied with his victory. In front of him is the result of his attack, a ravine-like opening that extends far, splitting a mountain in half. He coughs, beginning to feel the effects of pushing his limits, but gives Feral a smile nonetheless. In the kingdom a few days later, the dragon's head is displayed at a podium in front of the citizens, and everyone cheers for the prince's unprecedented crown system ceremony. He waves at them, but his mind is still preoccupied with the goal of finishing his resurrection spell. The chief of the knights is still in awe of the achievement, remembering how he worried when the battle dragged on until dawn. Ars turns back, ending the festivities and announcing his return to the research lab. They talk about how his feet will keep the kingdom safe for some time, but Feral adds that there's more to come. Her words are interrupted by a loud thud. Behind them, they see the prince on the ground, a pool of blood coming from his mouth. Shocked by the turn of events, they rush him to the infirmary. The doctor explains that, in the end, his body couldn't withstand the match with the dragon. He exceeded his limitations by continuously using an enormous amount of magic. He regrettably announces that the prince doesn't have much time left. Ars questions his life, wondering if he's being punished for being too devoted to magic and neglecting his body as a result. Despite defeating a great dragon and almost finishing his resurrection spell, is it really the end for him? He rejects the idea and asks the others to keep a secret. The only people who know about his research are Feral, 
the chief, and his brother IRS. He declares that he's going to use himself as a conductor for the experiment, sacrificing his dying body and separating his soul from his memory. The magician casts reincarnation magic, an untested spell he found while researching, despite not knowing the possible repercussions. The only thing certain is his imminent death, should he not do anything to survive. Ars tells his companions to forget him if all else fails, vowing to stay alive until he successfully creates the reincarnation spell. He activates the spell, and everything turns pitch black. He opens his eyes, finding himself in an unfamiliar, dark, and enclosed space. To make sure his spell worked, he faces a puddle and sees himself in the body of a child. However, he notices that it doesn't look like a cart citizen and guesses that he must come from a poor place given his tattered appearance. He waves it off, satisfied that he can continue with his research. A man, presumably his father, calls out to him, calling him Wiles. He says the boy is five now and must be taught to work. He's dragged up the stairwell, the man asserting that he must learn how to chop wood quickly. Wiles asks why, and it's revealed that their whole tribe is made up of slaves. He falls from the shock of his reality, not even being reborn as a commoner. Although Karts has more freedom than other places, it's still too much. To make things worse, he notices a blood contract mark on his father's chest, signifying that his slavery is for life. He looks at his own chest and sees the same mark. Before even fully processing things, he's dragged away again, with his father explaining that everyone is assigned to their own workplace. Following along, he realizes he won't even be allowed outside of the area, let alone continue with his research as a slave. They reach the middle of the forest, and Wiles is told that his job is to cut down all of the trees in front of him. He says it's impossible as there are too many for a child like him to handle. The man steps forward, saying he'll be able to do it with no trouble in 10 years. While quietly complaining about his unfortunate situation, his father chops a tree down with a single slash, saying he can cut down 300 trees a day. The boy trembles at what he just saw, and lets out an excited shout, his eyes glimmering in amazement. He praises his father, who just bashfully smiles at his son's words. Wiles remembers hearing about a tribe of slaves who were specially trained to fight. At the possibility of him being reincarnated into that tribe, he vows to capitalize on the opportunity and to train hard to attain that power. He reminds himself of his objective to complete the resurrection spell and remembers that he only died due to his poor physical condition. But in this tribe, he can develop a body that'll be able to handle the strain of his magic. Seeing his situation in a brand new light, he finds a stronger determination to reach his dream. Several years after he was reincarnated, Wiles stands in front of a tree and assumes a fighting stance. He gathers energy into his hand, the sheer pressure of his presence is enough to drive nearby birds away. With one smooth movement, he cuts the tree down barehanded. He dusts himself off, finishing his daily mission after cutting down 300 trees. It's been 12 years since Ars was reincarnated as Wiles, and he's now grown into a powerful 17-year-old slave. Although the uncertainty of being born into a slave tribe brought him anxiety, he was still fortunate enough to be part of a family of martial artists, allowing him to develop a body that could withstand his magic power. That being said, he's finally grown strong enough to get back to his original goal, his research on the resurrection spell. As he's about to go home, a figure appears behind him, attempting to attack through an opening. However, Wiles reacts in no time, easily defending himself. The assailant is his cousin Delk Sai, who he urges to stop coming at him so suddenly. His cousin is a year younger than him, but has been practicing martial arts for far longer. Delk announces that today is the day they find out who's stronger. He wonders what the younger boy means as they just fought yesterday. The boy's face changes, saying this will be their final match, and that they should both fight without holding back. Before the other can ask what he means, Delk has already leaped above him, delivering a strong kick. He continues his assault, but all the attacks are blocked without difficulty. Wiles notices that his cousin seems a bit more enthusiastic than usual. He's very strong. In fact, according to his memories as ours, only a handful of people in the world are able to rely solely on their physical abilities. Adding on to that, Delk is considered a genius in their family of warriors. He might just be the strongest in the tribe, but that's only true if Wiles is excluded from the contenders. The young genius rushes at his cousin, forcing him to go all out. Understanding his wishes, the older boy complies, circulating magic into his body, ready to fight seriously. Sensing the air change around him, Delk excitedly dashes, but the other boy disappears from his sight, only reappearing to strike from above. He narrowly dodges and is about to counterattack, but a punch immediately comes to him. He's driven back from the force, noticing his opponent's increase in speed and power, but dashes in nonetheless. Magic circulation increases one's physical abilities, and it's something Wiles has intentionally sealed to focus on his training. On the other hand, 
Delk has been unconsciously using the technique since birth. In short, when he releases his seal, there's no way he could lose. Doing just that, he takes a punch square in the head, but remains unscathed. He completely overpowers the young genius, throwing him to the ground and raising his arm for a finishing blow. The other forfeits and Wiles snaps out of it, his fist inches away from Delk's face. He apologizes and the two of them laugh. He's confirmed his thoughts. The younger boy has suspected for a long time that his cousin always conceals his true strength. Wiles asks what's wrong with him and what he meant when he said that that was their final match. He looks at him seriously, telling him to ask his father and announcing that their jobs have been decided. His father appears, satisfied with his son's strength, and explains that his cousin has been chosen as the next head of the Psy clan. He's confused as to why he wasn't chosen as the head, despite winning the battle. What's going to happen to him? From his father's expression, he's sure he hasn't been sold as a slave. It's revealed that Wells has been chosen to attend the crown system as a guard slave. He's forgotten all about the event. He understands the assignment, as the Psy clan is made up of fighters, but he still cannot believe that he's going to participate as a guard for a royal family. The usual candidates for the crown system are those who are strong, as well as their entourage. This includes the slaves with a blood contract, unable to disobey any of their master's orders, and best suited as guards. Refusing to just give up on his goal after coming so far, he simply asks which family he'll be working for. His father explains that he will be sent to the Rondabro family in the Kingdom of Eurasia, where he will work as Princess Celicia's guard slave. Despite being a former prince, he's never heard of the kingdom's name, making him question the situation in the world. He's told that it's a rather small country, especially compared to a big one like Karat. Hearing this, he's relieved to know that his kingdom still exists, assured that things probably haven't changed much. He walks away. It's better this way, as smaller countries are more interesting. His father tells him that the royal family is waiting, and that he should set off immediately after he's prepared his things. Still worrying about how he might have been resurrected into a different time, he decides to investigate more once he sets off. It took him three days to reach Eurasia, and in that period, he was able to learn three things. Firstly, he was living in the kingdom of Clarina, controlled by the Clarina sect run by the Adventurer's Guild. Secondly, the reincarnation spell had no time lag. Lastly, the body of Ars Ditlad is somehow still alive, but Wells has no idea how. The current king of Karats is his brother IRS, and while it would be easier to govern if Ars were alive, he believes that his brother is not stupid enough to cover up his death. His thoughts are interrupted by murmurs from the crowd, talking about how filthy he is, obviously a slave. For the first time in 17 years, he's finally encountered ethical people outside of his clan. As such, he wasn't aware that he would stand out so much. A rag is thrown at his face and people jeer at him, saying they wouldn't have to see his filth that way, and that it must be nice to live without worrying about anything. He takes the cloth off and walks toward a couple of women in the crowd. They scream, but he just holds a lady's hand and thanks her for opening his eyes. She falls to the ground, charmed by the slave. Wiles leaves, deciding to set aside his worries about his brother and his past body, instead intending to focus on his goal. He finally reaches the royal castle, where he presents himself to the king, who then welcomes him warmly. The slave questions what he's seeing. The king looks weak and unsightly, almost as a symbol of a nation, only proving how small of a country Eurasia it is. He's confirmed that it's a nation just outside the five major kingdoms, and that the entire territory is only about as big as Karatsi's capital city. The king acknowledges his strength, confident in entrusting him with the princess' safety. Guarding a princess rather than a prince is rare, but he's determined to fulfill his duty regardless, eager to continue his research eventually. Princess Celicia walks forward, and the slave is speechless at the beauty of his new master. He didn't expect a small country like this to have such a breathtaking princess, noting that she'd probably receive countless proposals if she came from a bigger nation. He adds that he'd have been aware of her, had their ages been closer. They're about to end their briefing, the king ordering Wiles to protect Celicia until the end of the crown system. When the princess interjects, she walks in front of the guard slave and declares that she has no need for him. The two men are baffled at the unexpected rejection. Celicia and Wiles are seated in front of each other for lunch. The table is set, and the princess calls for them to begin. He thinks back to their time in the audience room, where she said that she doesn't need a guard, who doesn't even have table manners. Her words made him realize how naive she is, underestimating the dangers of the crown system, and focusing on trivial things like manners. However, he has no choice but to gain her trust, else he stray farther from his goal. He asserted that he's familiar with table manners, and now they're having a meal to prove it. 
The former prince eats politely, gently setting his utensils down after. Confident in his past experiences as a prince, he asks the princess, who then fails him. Puzzled, he wonders if certain standards and practices have changed in the past 17 years. He asks her how it's supposed to be done, and she gracefully shows him how to have a meal. She arrogantly tells him that that is what manners are. Before she could boast any further, he picked up his utensils and began to eat again, now matching the movement and attitude of the princess. They're surprised at his immediate adjustment. After his meal, he apologizes for mistakenly assuming that she would follow Karat's etiquette, realizing that she observes the seal leaning way. She doesn't know what he's talking about, but laughs nonetheless, saying he passed. The princess thought he was a brute who knew nothing but fighting, but he proved her wrong, even exhibiting control over his emotions. She explains that she tested him, as she doesn't want anyone shady by her side, and that he just barely earned her trust. With their new relationship, they head to the rooftop to see the princess' magical abilities. On the way, they stop by a bed of Balmuth flowers. Admiring them, Wiles comments that they're extremely difficult to grow, but are flourishing quite well in their garden. She's surprised at how knowledgeable he is, perhaps too much compared to other slaves. Salvaging his cover, he simply studied hard to guard her well, adding that everything he does is meant to ensure her safety. Embarrassed by his bluntness, she shyly accepts his words, while he's just relieved to have gotten out of the situation. Celicia notices a smaller bud among the Balmuth flowers and reaches out to hold it. Her guard spots something odd and swiftly stops her hand before she can touch it. Surprised at his sudden actions, she commands him to let her hand go, but he refuses. Saying the flower is dangerous, he explains that it is not a Balamoth, but a Balamoth Mdoki, a poisonous variant containing neurotoxins, recognizable by its different petals and thorns. He concludes that someone must have wanted the princess to touch it and intentionally planted it in front of the bed. He looks to the horizon, realizing that the job will be a lot more difficult than he thought. He sees the kingdom properly, and is stunned by the breathtaking view of the developing nation. Celicia calls his attention and tells him to prepare himself, as he's about to witness the simultaneous manipulation of all four elemental attributes. Wells is surprised by her declaration as a magician himself, he knows how rare it is to find someone capable of the feat. His expectations are quickly watered down, as he sees her barely summon low-level spells, although he is surprised that she used all four attributes. The slave asks if that's all she can do, provoking the insulted princess. Accepting his boldness, she tells him to watch as she unleashes her strongest spell. His expectations rise once more, as her power might grow exponentially when controlling a single element. She conjures a fire in the shape of a reptile, and looks at him to brag. He's stunned at how weak she is, noting how she's only capable of a meager level 3 spell. Then again, not everyone can summon such a textbook example of the spell. He tries to motivate her, praising her level 3 spell. Celicia is astonished for a second, then insists that it's a level 1 spell, and that he just can't recognize it, as he must have grown up without seeing magic. He chokes down his honest feelings, and bows down an apology for his shallow knowledge. She hurriedly tells him that it's fine, and brings up the incident with the Balamuth, thanking him for saving her from danger. He begins to say something about the crown system, but she cuts him off. She tells him to stop calling her your highness, to which he asks if master is more to her liking. Wells inches his way closer to what the princess wants to be called, and she eventually tells him to call her Celicia, preferring to be addressed as an equal. She reasons that such formalities would make her a target, and that she doesn't want others to know that her family has guard slaves. He stands up properly, and tells Celicia that he looks forward to working with her, adding that she needs to buy him new clothes, as his current appearance easily gives out his identity. She accepts, but is surprised at how fast his attitude changed. Wells and Celicia arrive at the Adventurer's Guild, Cloriana's headquarters, marking the beginning of the crown system. They head to the guild quarters first, as nobles such as Celicia must confirm their identity before becoming adventurers. She waves his explanation off, and notes that clothes truly make the man staring at him. Failing to register the compliment, he thinks that the princess is insulting his new equipment. He's called an idiot, but the guard is satisfied as long as he looks reliable. She comments on how quickly he changes his attitude, but he tells her to pay no mind to it, as it's just how he is outside. Remembering where they are, Celicia reminds Wiles of his duty to protect her, and he reassuringly tells her that no one can touch her while he's around. As usual, she's embarrassed by his words and runs away to register them. He wonders if he said something wrong, thinking about how their mental gap is similar to that of father and child. He hears shouting nearby, salespeople boasting of their achievement. These people are those who wish to join the society of noble adventurers, but won't even be spared a glance by senior nobles. He says it's pointless, and Celicia, swiftly returning, 
Asked what's pointless, he explains that nobles will pay them no mind, no matter how much they promote themselves. If they're truly talented, then the guild would have recommended them, and the fact that they weren't is a testament to their inadequacy. The princess is once again amazed at how knowledgeable he is, constantly surpassing her expectation. But he says that the way they casually speak to each other is already far from a common slave's experience. Regardless of merciful and kind rulers, this is the first time he's seen royalty have such a relationship with a slave. She's a strange princess, who doesn't even think about the difference in their status, truly treating him like an equal. He asks about her experience in the guild, expecting her to have received a low-level mission. Against all expectations, she pulls out a guild request to defeat Era, the Rage Dragon. He shouts at her, questioning her decision as Era is one of the four great dragons on the same level as the gluttonous dragon walls beat at his peak. The guild staff told her the same thing and suggested that she take on something else. As such, she decides to take her guard with her and asks him to take a look at missions they can accept at the guild. She adds that she wants to see his skills for herself and that it'd be okay given his knowledge of requests. He accepts, planning to avoid all the reckless quests that are too risky. In the guild, an old man shows in what they have and recommends missions ranked A and B. Meanwhile, Wells notices the number of requests from the Karat's kingdom, which takes up almost 80% of the stack, with the rest coming from faraway countries. The man says it's only natural, as it's a great nation, but the former prince knows better. He's well aware that a multitude of adventurers gather there, making it odd for the kingdom to send in so many requests to foreign lands. Additionally, the amount almost doubled from the time he was still there. Wanting to know more about the situation, he accepts a Karat's base mission. During their dinner, Celicia asks why he took the request, doubting his decision to pick a B-ranker and wary of the destroy the heretic's title. The guard explains that, among the B-ranks, it seemed to be one of the safer ones, and that they could gain several benefits from the church back mission. Furthermore, requests of that rank aren't usually so simple, so they can consider themselves lucky to encounter such a beneficial one. He turns his attention to the oddly high number of listings from Karts, noting that the kingdom invests a lot in the church, making no room for heresy in the first place. Their food arrives amidst their conversation, and the princess is disgusted with the meal placed before her. Although she's lost her appetite from the sight alone, she says she should get used to it. Wells appraises their food and sees the presence of a small amount of poison in his. He wonders why, but eats anyway. Meanwhile, Celicia asks him if he's noticed the others watching him, explaining that they're jealous of him for accompanying someone as beautiful as her. The guard realizes that this must be the reason they tried to poison him. Moving away from the conversation, she mentions that according to the man from the guild, all the adventurers who took on the quest before them have disappeared, which is why it's a B rank. He nonchalantly drinks his poisoned beverage, saying many requests are upgraded when unfulfilled for a long time. She comments on his enthusiasm for his first quest, but for him, anything is better than fighting a great dragon. Wells then tells her that she isn't eating properly, and chomps a chunk of meat into his mouth, holding it by the bone. He points toward everyone else in the room, and she sees them all eating the same way. The guard expresses that he's just worried about her, as her cover will be easily blown if she continues to eat like royalty. Accepting his reasoning, she makes peace with her situation and bites down. He smiles, satisfied with her determination. At night, the princess complains about staying in such a filthy inn, but is told that it's the best way to conceal her identity. Bidding her a restful night, he walks out to guard the door. Celicia stops him, telling him to rest in the room instead. To make sure he can't decline, the princess orders her slave to sleep on the bed beside her. Princess Celicia commands her slave to sleep with her, saying there's no danger as he cannot disobey her anyway. Wells tries to insist that he can sleep while guarding the door, but she argues that sleeping on the bed would be much more comfortable than on the ground. With fervor words, she orders him to rest when he needs to, and to stop avoiding it just because he's a slave. Again, he's speechless at how the princess doesn't think about their difference in status at all. He eventually complies, saying he wouldn't do anything to a child, whether it was in order or not. Angered by his words, she asks if he just called her a child. He begins to say that he's well past 40, but catches himself and says he's 17, only a year older than Celicia. She looks at him suspiciously and cautiously asks if he likes 40-year-old women, a somewhat judgmental look on her face. She criticizes his taste and turns around to sleep, denying all of Wells' attempts to explain and defend himself. He sits on the bed, sighing at the misunderstanding. The next day, they set out on their mission beginning at the Gate of Karats and heading to South Laurier, where several adventurers gather. When they reach the local guild, they're greeted by an empty hall. A staff member stands as the lone person inside. There are usually at least five to six parties in the guild, 
And what's odder is that there were no adventurers in town either. Unable to find anyone else, they walked through the town, talking about the quest. Whilst thinks about how the church would also be affected if the issue really was related to heresy. However, even the staff had nothing to say, only guessing that the number of adventurers must have decreased along with the number of quests. While the princess feels like they've hit a dead end, the guard senses that they're getting closer to the core of the problem. He stops in front of a closed pub, saying they should directly ask adventurers instead. Most pubs are closed at noon, so they decide to come back later. At night, the two walk to find a pub they can search, still unsure if there will be any adventurers. Wiles says that's another thing they need to confirm, and that they must leave immediately if that really is the case. The princess suggests that they should look into those situations, still unaware of how dangerous her position is. The guard says he'll investigate the pubs alone, dissuading his master from joining the dangerous mission. Interrupting his lecture, Salisha reminds him of their duties, hers being the completion of the crown system, and his being to protect her from any potential danger. Continuing, she declares that she cannot just sit around while he does everything, and that this is an opportunity for her to grow as well. Finally, she says that she hates being so ignorant all the time, staring right into his eyes. The guard stops arguing, but insists that her safety is the top priority. He adds that it would be much better if they had another guard, allowing them to attack and defend at the same time, but the princess shouts that she can fight as well. He's telling her to avoid straying too far, but suddenly sees a group of cloaked figures surrounding them. Immediately getting an idea from a quick glance, he asks them what they want, as they aren't even holding their swords properly. Salisha cowers behind him, despite being confident in her ability to fight just moments ago. He gives them a chance to drop their swords, but smells a sweet scent in the air. Sleeping incense, a drug that makes people lose consciousness. It's not potent enough to take him down, but the princess is already fast asleep. He catches her from falling, questioning the situation, as the men even resorted to such tricks. The assailants, on the other hand, are confused as to why Wells is still standing. Intending to interrogate them, the guard swiftly takes a man down with one strike, still carrying the princess. He stands over them, demanding an explanation for their actions. Under the cloak is a frail old man, wearing a cross necklace. Realizing they're no match for him, the others drop their weapons and beg him to let the man go. They explain that they were the ones who begged him to participate in the attacks. With a pitiful look on his face, a man shouts that they only attack adventurers. In a house, Celicia is still unconscious from the drug, while Wells interrogates their attacker. They briefly explain that, in recent years, increased taxes have made local struggle. To make ends meet, a lot of them have resorted to recklessly attacking adventurers, all because they were too poor to keep up with the fees. The old man adds that their lord simply raised their taxes upon the king's orders. Wiles wonders if his brother has turned into a tyrannical king, and realizes that the men in front of him are the reason why there are no adventurers in town. They try to excuse their behavior, saying they never killed anyone, and that they only stripped them of all their money and equipment. The guard notes that even that is already terrible enough. He brings up the topic of increasing heretics and, with a menacing expression, asks if they committed those acts in the name of heresy. They all vehemently object, pulling out their cross necklaces, and explain that they belong to the Clarina sect. Those who sin and listen to evil words have no place in the town. Given their crosses, he confirms that the group isn't made up of heretics. The old man, apparently the mayor of the town, slams his head on the table, saying he will accept the punishment for their actions alone. The others try to stop him, but Wiles says it doesn't matter anyway, as all the adventurers they defeated probably wouldn't have lasted in the field anyway. To their relief, the guard lets their sins slide, but warns them that others may not be as forgiving, and that they could lose their lives on the spot. The mayor understands, knowing that they only got this far, since the previous adventurers only ever carried cheap equipment. He adds that they attacked the pair, as it was the first time they'd seen such high-end equipment, and that they were tempted by it. Wiles sums it up, saying only low-ranked adventurers have come to town, at least since the locals began attacking them. It is a strange situation, given how the evil cult has yet to spread to the area. Due to its location right by the southern gate of the Karat's kingdom, the place should be filled with both high- and low-ranking adventurers. There must be a different reason for the issue, they just haven't figured it out yet. The guard says they're going to spend the night there, as the princess is still unconscious from the sleeping incense. The others immediately prepare to room for them. Later on, Wiles and Celicia are wandering through an unpaved forest, looking for something. Their goal is to destroy the evil cult, which usually takes over small villages, before gradually invading the big city in the middle of it. From this information, it's likely that the cult's base is situated in the village near Mid-River City, 
They follow the mayor's directions and have been walking through the forest for three days. Celicia complains and her guard remarks that she has a lot to improve on, listing down her recent shortcomings and warning her to stay on her toes. He looks up at the sky, unable to feel the presence of monsters or living creatures in the area. Just then, he senses something and tells the princess to stop moving. A bloodied man rushes at them with a scream, but the guard swiftly slams him to the ground, asking what he's doing. He notices a deep wound on the man's back and the crest of the adventurers from the Cassandra Kingdom. He asks if Wiles is one of them. Before he could clarify, a burst of fire shoots at them, but he easily ducks down to dodge. The area hit then explodes. A female mage emerges accompanied by a burly man. The wounded adventurer explains that the pair are from the Rain Kingdom and hunt high-ranked adventurers who come into the forest, taking down his teammates when they arrive. The woman says she can't hear him and pulls out the severed heads of the man's companion. She finally notices Wiles and Celicia, who she guesses are participants in the crown system, noting that the guard seems especially strong. A couple more men appear behind her, and she declares that they will be taken care of quickly. The princess trembles in fear, but her guard calmly steps forward, asking them which god they believe in. The woman proudly announces that they're followers of god Edina, laughing at his question. Satisfied with her answer, Wiles draws his sword and pierces through the woman in an instant. Not even realizing what happened yet, he then kicks her away, driving her through a tree. He says they're irrelevant to their quest, so he doesn't need to bother with them too much. Determined to fulfill his duty to the princess, the guard spares no restraint in taking her down. Terrified, the last member of Team Rain begs for mercy. Celicia and the man from Cassandra Kingdom watch as Wiles slays the man in one blow. Afterward, Wells tends to the wounded adventurer as he rides in pain. The man quickly recovers and inquires about Wells' name, deeply impressed by his ability. Wells introduces himself and Celicia as adventurers from Eurasia. The man is visibly clueless about the small kingdom and mentions his intention to return to South Laurier. Wells advises him to report the incident involving Team Rain to the guild. The man agrees as he recalls the cruelty that happened to his team. As a token of gratitude, he hands Celicia a bag brimming with gold coins, leaving her bewildered. Wiles announces their plan to proceed to the gathering point, but the man informs him that the location no longer exists. The place was reduced to ruins after a monster attack. They had initially embarked on a quest to slay this creature, but fell victim to an ambush. The man cautions Wiles about their mission, revealing that the monster is none other than Dragon Algies. The two reach the gathering point only to be stunned by the devastation left in the wake of Dragon Algae. Celicia expresses her concern for the people who once resided there, while Wells prays silently. She gets his attention and commends him for effortlessly defeating their enemies. Wells gazes at her and comments that their enemies were too weak. He then inquires whether she knows what fate awaits Team Rain, once they are reported to the guild. The princess contemplates the consequences and concludes that the standing of the Rain Kingdom will weaken. She also believes that Eurasia's reputation will improve, as the man from Cassandra Kingdom appears genuinely thankful to them. Wiles, however, clarifies that it's not as simple as it seems. Since the woman from the Rain Kingdom attacked adventurers from various other kingdoms, their kingdom could face retaliatory strikes once the news spreads. Celicia acknowledges this, but is convinced that Wiles' actions must somehow benefit Eurasia. He confirms that Eurasia won't be mentioned in the man's report, which puzzles Celicia. He explains that the man must have discerned their intentions, which is why he rewarded them with gold. Celicia remains confused, prompting Wiles to reassure her that she'll understand once they reach Midriver. The two reach the Midriver metropolis of the Karts Kingdom, where they receive news of an ongoing attack on the Rain Kingdom. Wiles surmises that the kingdom may have already been a target, given the speed of the attack. Celicia reads the report, and as Wiles had foreseen, it reports that Cassandra Kingdom has launched an attack on the Rain Kingdom and it makes no mention of Eurasia. Wells confesses he didn't seek credit for defeating the Rain team, so they accepted the money and let the man take credit. Celicia is surprised as she now sees Wells as a Eurasian. However, he clarifies that his sole duty is to protect her, and it is Celicia who should leave the lasting impression of Eurasia on people's minds. Feeling somewhat embarrassed, Celicia agrees and expresses her goal to achieve great feats with her magic. While looking at Celicia, Wiles contemplates that she needs a mentor to help her refine her magical abilities. He's wary of her discovering his magical abilities, as it might affect his status and research on resurrection, leaving him wishing for someone else who can use magic. At the guild, the two are surprised upon discovering that no one has wanted to become an apprentice of Eurasia for years. This disheartens Celicia, especially when she learns that dozens of people recently applied to join Team Cassandra. Sensing her disappointment, Wiles clarifies that in the crown system, 
Having fewer members is easier. They should ideally have five people, but one should suffice for now. While Celicia thinks that he's sufficient for her, Wiles counters that they need an additional guard, so he can focus on a fence while someone protects her. Upon hearing this, Celicia becomes alarmed once more about their lack of apprentices, but Wiles quickly reassures her. He inquires about the availability of free adventurers who haven't joined other kingdoms yet. The man confirms their existence, but mentions that they are only mid-level adventurers. Wiles expresses his dissatisfaction, emphasizing his need for adventurers with exceptional talent. The man looks at Wiles, and affirms the presence of high-level adventurers, but declines to join great countries. Wiles proceeds to inquire about anyone with magical abilities, but the man dismisses the possibility, stating that while he can find free swordsmen, it's nearly impossible to locate any available magic users. As they leave, the man tells them that he won't bear any responsibility should any unforeseen events occur. They head to a new village in their quest for the dragon algae, but it appears that the village has already been abandoned due to the fear of the dragon. Celicia lets out a sigh and remarks that there's only one gathering point remaining. Wiles tells her not to be disappointed because they both desire a formidable adventurer to join their team. Celicia responds by stating that she isn't necessarily seeking strong adventurers. Wiles retorts that she doesn't sound like someone who vowed to defeat the Dragon Era, causing her to blush in embarrassment. He reminds her that only the adventurers from Cassandra accepted the quest to slay Algis, and there must be a powerful magician among them, given Algis's tremendous strength. He further explains that recruiting such a magician would be beneficial for them. In response, Celicia gives him an amused look and remarks that he seems to know more about the guild despite his status as a slave. He teases her, asking if she is sulking, to which she shouts that she is actually complimenting him. Just then, the thunderous roar fills the air. Wiles quickly recognizes it as coming from Algis and immediately rushes outside. Upon seeing smoke from the nearby mountain, he instructs Celicia to stay close, and they make their way through the forest toward the mountain. While they can hear the dragon's roar, Wiles doesn't hear any explosions, leading Wiles to speculate about those engaged in the battle with the dragon. They finally locate the dragon and witness a group of swordsmen engaged in an intense struggle to defeat it. The swordsmen charge forward and launch a coordinated attack against Algis. The two are amazed at how they fight head-on, and Celicia is surprised to discover that all the swordsmen are female, as evidenced by their purple armor. Wiles remarks on the exceptional toughness of Algis's skin, and states that magical attacks might be more effective than swords, but surprisingly the six swordswomen hold their own. However, what truly struck Wiles is the female warrior leading the swordswomen, as she exudes a remarkable sense of power. Meanwhile, the female warrior observes them. Celicia inquires whether Wiles intends to assist the swordswomen, but he responds by explaining that what they are currently facing is likely a male Algis, as the female one is significantly larger and more dangerous, especially if it hasn't had enough food during pregnancy or while raising a newborn. As he mentions that it's also Dragon's mating period, a deafening sound echoes through the air. Celicia panics upon seeing a larger algae soaring above them. Wiles confirms it's a female algae while marveling at its size. Celicia scolds him, stressing that it's not the moment for admiration. As the dragon is heading straight for them, she becomes frantic, urging him to run, but Wiles responds by explaining that fleeing would be futile, as the dragon could easily catch up to them. As the dragon rapidly approaches, a terrified Celicia urgently commands Wiles to bring it down. In response, Wiles's blood contract activates, reacting to Celicia's command. The female warrior watches as Celicia exclaims for her guard. Wiles counters the dragon's assault, surprised by how instinctively he responds to the power of the blood contract. As he reflects on this, Celicia alerts him to the dragon's impending return. The algae swoops in toward Wiles, and he tells Celicia to stay where she at. Wiles deftly evades the dragon's attack, leaping onto its back, leaving Celicia baffled by his actions. In a swift move, Wiles cleaves the dragon in half, leaving both Celicia and the female warrior in shock. Triumphant, he announces that he has killed the dragon just as the princesses commanded. She is speechless for a while, but soon praises him for his heroic feat. Suddenly, the female warrior steps forward, sheathing her sword to Wiles. He inquires about her intentions, and she states that his attack was fascinating. With a challenging glint in her eye, she proposes a duel to Wiles. Meanwhile, the male Algis meets its defeat at the hands of the other swordswomen, who witness their leader, Nea, proposing a duel. Wiles accepts the challenge and reassures Celicia that he merely wishes to assess her strength. He believes her to be skilled enough to challenge him. Even after witnessing him slay the Algis, Wiles inquires about determining the winner, to which Nea lets him decide. The duel commences, and a frightened Celicia watches anxiously. Nea takes the initiative, launching a powerful attack, 
swiftly countered by Wiles. Celicia screams as the impact of the attack resonates. The warrior is taken aback by Wiles' defensive skills, impressed by his rapid reactions. She presses on with the battle, even unsheathing her second sword, revealing herself as a dual wielder. Wiles, recognizing the strength of his opponent, becomes increasingly fired up. As the intense duel unfolds, Wiles carefully assesses Nea's potent attacks, delivered at continuous high speed. He reflects that his former self might not have been able to withstand such an assault, but his current self only needs to create a significant opening. In a swift move, Wiles disarms Nea, causing her to concede defeat. The rest of the swordswomen rush to Nea's side to check on her, while Celicia hurries over to Wiles. He acknowledges that despite winning the duel, Nea is evidently a high-ranking adventurer. Nea then declares that she has finally found him. She proceeds to remove her helmet, revealing her face, and introduces herself as Nea Fromage. She extends an apology for challenging Wiles without a proper introduction. Celicia is taken aback by her beauty, as the warrior asks for Wiles' name. He introduces himself and acknowledges the warrior's strength. He then inquires about her statement of finally finding him. Nea explains that she and her companions have been on a journey, seeking someone worthy of their loyalty, and they have now found that person in Wiles. At that moment, the other swordswomen remove their helms and pledge their loyalty to Wiles. Both Celicia and Wiles are left in shock by this sudden turn of events, especially when all the swordswomen bow down to Wiles, earnestly requesting the honor of serving him. Wiles is left puzzled as he looks at the swordswomen bowing before him. He quickly apologizes and explains that the decision isn't within his control, as he is merely a servant to Princess Celicia. The swordswomen take offense, assuming that Wiles is trying to reject their loyalty. However, Nea steps in, questioning why Wiles is content with being just a servant when his power could lead to much more. Celicia intervenes, clarifying that Wiles' primary duty is to protect her, the Princess of Eurasia. Nea, seemingly unaware of Eurasia, casually remarks that she's never heard of such a kingdom. Humiliated, the princess allows Wiles to explain their blood contract and verify her identity. After the clarification, Wiles informs Nea that if she wishes to follow him, she must gain the princess' acceptance. Celicia pretends to be disinterested but quickly accepts them, recognizing the advantages they'd bring to the team. She asks Wiles why he doesn't seem interested in the swordswomen, and he admits that he prefers magicians over them. Nea expresses her disdain for magicians, claiming they never engage in direct combat. Wiles finds this attitude strange, as usually, warriors of both types join forces to defeat opponents. Celicia questions Wiles about whether he's bothered by the fact that their new members dislike magicians. He responds that these swordswomen are different from other adventurers, as mere promises are insufficient for them to become vassals of royalty. He insists they need to return to the guild immediately to formally register the swordswomen as their members. Celicia hesitates at the thought of meeting the guild official again, but Wiles encourages her to be patient. She regains her cheerful demeanor and leads her team to Midriver. At the guild, the formidable swordswomen surprise everyone by revealing their faces for the first time. The guild official is delighted by Nea's presence and inquires if she found the Algis, to which she responds by claiming she defeated it. This astonishes the onlookers as the warriors are both strong and beautiful, living up to their rumors. The official expresses deep admiration for the news, remarking that he didn't expect Nea to kill two dragons at once. However, Nea clarifies that she didn't kill the female Algis, pointing to Wiles instead. This confuses the official, and she adds that they are there to officially register as vassals of Princess Celicia of Eurasia, leading everyone surprised. The official thought that Nea must be joking. One of the swordswomen, Venito, punches a hole through the guild's counter and urging the man to proceed. Terrified, the official hurries along while Nea reprimands Venito. Wells intervenes, explaining that he intends to downsize their group to achieve more success in the crown system, and she is obviously the most powerful. Nea understands this and looks at her team. The swordswomen recognize their limitations and vow to search for the evil cult as a separate unit. Wells agrees to this, and the remaining swordswomen bid their farewells and set out on their new mission. Meanwhile, Nea offers her apologies once again to Celicia for her earlier rudeness. The princess entrusts her life to Nea, who assures her she can be protected without magicians. Wiles, overhearing this, questions Nea about her strong dislike for magicians. With a hateful gleam in her eyes, she reveals that her disdain is directed at the magician who leads them, the Royal Highness Ars. Wiles is taken aback upon hearing his former name and demands further explanation. Nea goes on to explain that Ars is an oppressive and manipulative ruler, which shocks Wiles. In the midst of the night, Wiles finds himself alone in the forest, gazing at an abandoned building and deep in thought. 
After settling into their lodging, Naya approaches him with a request to have a private room. She clarifies that it's not a complaint, but rather due to her discomfort with sharing a room with a man, given she's never done so before. She awkwardly tries to explain, leaving Wiles feeling equally uneasy. Celicia interjects, mentioning that Wiles is her first time as well, making the situation even more awkward for him. Naya blushes at Celicia's remark, but Wiles clarifies that he shared a room with the princess because of his duty. Now that Naya is here, she can stay with Celicia, and he can sleep outside to keep watch. Celicia objects, insisting that Wiles deserves a proper bed. He counters, explaining that more people knowing her true identity makes them vulnerable to threats like those from the Rain Kingdom. Thus, they need to exercise caution. In the present moment, Wiles reflects on how Naya and her team have made his job easier, with her guarding Celicia and the rest of the group searching for the evil cult. This grants him more free time to focus on his personal objectives. He returns to his earlier thoughts about his previous body of ours being alive and controlling his brother, IRS. He swears to investigate this mystery as he enters the abandoned building and pushes open a door. Inside, he finds a room filled with numerous deceased monsters. In a flashback to the morning, Wiles gathered information about the evil cults. At night, he collected the corpses of monsters slain by adventurers. In the present, he surveys the pile of corpses he gathered and begins casting a magic spell, creating a resurrection circle around the lifeless creatures. He infuses more magic, and the cadavers start to stir and groan, their wounds healing. However, Ars's magic, as he knew it before, was far more potent, and he needs more practice. One of the goblins breathes and moves but quickly stops. Wells wonders if he took too long to cast the spell as he channeled magic into the atmosphere instead of using his own. Undeterred, he continues to perform the spell repeatedly, but after numerous attempts, he still hasn't succeeded. He observes that the goblins can only make slight movements, similar to the effects of his premature resurrection spell. He realizes that he must locate the magician who revived Ars's body and inserted another soul inside. This is the key to saving Karts from oppression, but he acknowledges that it won't be easy. He apologizes to the goblins he experimented on, explaining that the spell will dissipate by dawn, and they are free to do as they please until then. The next morning, Celicia asks if Wiles slept well, reminding him not to be distracted if he stayed up all night. He replies that Naya can still guard her, but the princess dismisses this notion. Naya comments that the princess cares deeply for her guard, but may not know how to express it. Suddenly, they hear a commotion, and witness a group of adventurers rushing through the forest. Wiles is puzzled, and Celicia inquires about the situation, while Naya suggests it might be an emergency quest. Wiles becomes alert upon hearing this, especially when Celicia reports that abnormal creatures have emerged in the forest, specifically creatures known as goblin zombies. Wiles ponders this new information, realizing that it's the first time he's encountered the term goblin zombies, indicating that these creatures have somehow risen from the dead. A sudden realization dawns on him, and he fears that he might be the cause of this problem. The goblin zombies are particularly troublesome, as they instantly regenerate, no matter how many times they're cut. Naya wonders if it's a new type of goblin that's immortal. They point to the direction the monsters supposedly came from, but Celicia says that it doesn't concern them, as the problem is unrelated to the crown system. However, Wiles insists that they do. The resurrection spell should have worn off at dawn, there's no way they're still moving. Fortunately, nobody knows that he caused the mess, planning to take care of it himself before the damage spreads. The princess calls him, but he asserts that it's interesting and might be related to evil cults. The newcomer agrees with him, saying they can show off their power with this quest. Celicia is left with no choice but to accept, but notes how her guard is uncharacteristically interested in something. Suddenly, adventurers come rushing in, fleeing from the horde of goblin zombies. The princess panics at their unexpected arrival, but Wiles calms her down, saying she has nothing to fear. He thinks back to the previous night, when the goblins had no shred of intelligence. Doubtful of the adventurer's words, a silhouette emerges from the forest, towering over the party. The foe is a moving mass of goblins that seem to have melded to form a huge body. While the two are preoccupied with their thoughts, Naya asks for permission to try first, and leaps to the monster's head. In no time, she slices it down into several chunks, all falling to the ground. Her leader is relieved, but the slave tells them that it isn't over yet. The sliced bits of the goblin then move on their own, reattaching one by one and eventually regenerating completely. The swordsman tries again, unleashing a flurry of precise slashes. Meanwhile, Wiles picks up a severed piece and uses his appraisal skill, allowing him to figure something out. He then tells Naya to step back and watch him. He takes a fighting stance, focusing energy into his fist. The guard dashes forward, 
and punches an enormous hole through the monster, causing it to explode into bits and pieces. The princess begins to doubt him, but the goblin zombies remain on the ground, unmoving and lifeless. With a single punch, Wiles completely obliterated the supposedly immoral enemy. In a tavern, locals and adventurers rejoice over the defeat of the goblin zombies. They praise Nea as the savior of their town, offering to buy her drinks to show their gratitude. She insists the Wiles was the one who saved them, but they ignore her words. The princess asks her guard if he isn't bothered by the lack of recognition, but he says he's relieved, fortunately avoiding all the attention. She then asks how he took the goblin down, wondering if he got an idea to stop it from regenerating. The answer was all attributes neutralization magic. The resurrection spell was a combination of various magic types, one of which was time rewind. To resolve the commotion he created, he simply had to cancel the rewinding magic out. Unfortunately, he couldn't reveal all that. Just then, the door opens with a band, and a loud voice resonates throughout the bar. A woman is looking for the person who slayed the goblin zombie, demanding that they step forward. Everyone is shocked when they realize who it is, dumbfounded at her presence in such a place. She repeats her demand, hurrying everyone up. Wiles asks who she is, and is hastily informed that she's Festerize Ditland, the first princess of cards. Putting things together, he realizes that the arrogant woman is her niece. He looks at Nea, who is taking most of the attention for the feat. She's motionless, observably nervous. The slave stands to identify himself, and the princess sneers at his insolent demeanor. She says stupidity is a crime that may destroy him someday, and calls him outside to explain, understanding that he's not from the kingdom. Outside, she tells a soldier to be thorough. Wiles recognizes that the old man before him is Dallas, the chief knight of cards, and his former sword-fighting teacher. Most importantly, he's one of the two who were present when Ars cast the reincarnation spell. He wonders why he's with the princess, when the chief asks if he was the one who subjugated the goblin zombie. He confirms the fact, playfully asking for a reward. His companions come out as well, and Dallas recognizes the sword princess, who was reported to have joined a party from Eurasia. She begins to show hostility, but Wiles stops her, claiming the chief as his opponent. He asks what their objective is, and the old man initially thanks him for defeating the monster. However, he prods at the possibility of him causing the abnormality. He's shocked, wondering how they managed to link him to the incident. Dallas explains that they received a testimony, which said that he was seen in the area where the goblins appeared first. He senses the danger of the situation, knowing that the blood contract would force him to reveal his identity should Celicia order him to tell the truth. The exposure of his magical capabilities would have several drawbacks, all leading to the further halt of his research. In other words, losing the princess trust would end everything for him. Celicia then declares that Wiles is her personal guard, and demands that they stop making such accusation. He tries to stop her, but the chief adds that he also knows about them, accepting the quest against evil cults. He have no suspicions if they gave their names and openly investigated, however. They chose to do it secretly. Just as sharp as always, he lays a trap, waiting for the party to fall in. Knowing that beating around the bush will get them nowhere, the guard asserts that they aren't heretics. He bravely brings up the topic of Ars Ditland's death 17 years ago, saying it's no wonder evil cults have become widespread throughout the kingdom. Dallas' expression changes at the mention of his king. His massive killing intent sends Nea and Celicia back. He says he will not tolerate such insulting rumors about the royal family, unsheathing his sword and commanding the guard to do the same. His pure killing intent was triggered by the mention of Ars' death. As the chief is not one to lie in such situations, he wonders if Ars really is alive. Furthermore, Festerize hides behind the man, shouting that she just met her uncle in the morning. Determined to shed light on the truth, Wiles takes a fighting stance and tells Dallas to come at him with all he has. In a flash, the tip of the sword is inches from his face, and the slave just barely defends against the chief's signature move, assaulting him with a hundred slashes in an instant. It's been seventeen long years, but the blade of the strongest swordsman has not dulled at all. He comments that the old man's true ability is incredible as always. Insulted by the boy's words, the knight says he doesn't remember ever showing him his true ability, then proceeds to unleash even more slashes, pushing Wiles back. Dallas continues his assault. Overwhelmed by the speed of his slashes, Celicia cannot even see what's happening. Nea has heard stories of this before. By continuously slashing at a tremendous speed, the chief creates a space that is both the strongest attack and an impregnable defense. In other words, it's a shield of slashes. The princess tells her slave to retreat, as he has no way of getting close. However, Wiles rushes straight at the shield, 
worrying his companion. He arrives at the technique's point of reach and begins to defend against all of the slashes. The sword princess soon understands his actions. The guard slaved with the method that suits him the best plans to break through the shield of slashes. Simply speaking, Dallas is the best swordsman on the continent, and it's not a good idea to fight him head on. However, Wilds is amazing at sword fighting himself and has inherited the Psy Clan's incredible physical capabilities, allowing him to react to each and every slash he sees. He rushed in, confident that he could do it. In other words, no matter how many slashes the chief makes, none will reach the guard. As expected, Wilds powers through all of the attacks, shocking his opponent. With terrifying focus in his eyes, he drives his blade down, breaking Dallas' sword in half, and ending the battle. Sheathing his sword, the victor says that they wouldn't have had such a wide gap years ago, and that 17 years without a worthy opponent have left him dull. With a smirk, he says that his former teacher's age has gotten the best of him. He approaches the chief and confirms that Ains is following R's orders. The man is shocked at his question, demanding an explanation as to how the slave knows. Festerize cuts in, grabbing her guard by the collar and scolding him for such a shameful loss. He apologizes, emphasizing that it's impossible for him to defeat such a talented man and urging her to retreat and reorganize their plan. The princess is outraged by his disgraceful attitude, telling him to wait for his punishment when they return. She notices that several onlookers have just witnessed the entire battle and are now watching them. Realizing her situation, she announces that she will be overlooking the group's insolence, to which Wiles arrogantly suggests that they overlook it in the future as well, if she wants to avoid trouble. Insulted, she tells him to mind his cockiness, promising to bring an army next time, and turning to lead with the chief. 